Uh, we have a, a beer in bottles right now with uh, staghorn sumac that I foraged. We're doing some fun beers combining uh, beer with fruit and wine grapes. We've got some sour beers that started at um, 1, 120 in barrels. We've got some sour beers that started at you know, 1030 in barrels. So it's uh, really our goal is to sort of push those um, edges of what sour beer can be. Um, we certainly got some sort of classic reds and some lambic -y inspired stuff, but um, I, I am always interested in what the next thing is. Um, when I wrote American Sour Beers, I mean, really most of it was done seven, eight, nine years ago. Um, sour beer in America looked a lot different than it does today. Um, back then, there were really, you know, 10 or 15 breweries that really had serious um, year-round sour beer programs, places like Jolly Pumpkin, uh, The Brewery, The Lost Abbey, Russian River, Cambridge Brewing. Um, and now there are, I mean, dozens of those breweries that uh, have popped up since then that are sour specialists that have, you know, in their own individual ways pushed um, the quality, the consistency, the, the variety of sour beer. Um, and I mean, I think as we all know, as home brewers, you know, there's only so much that one person can do that one brewery can do. And the more uh, brewers working on a problem, the more solutions you find, the more interesting um, flavor combinations that get discovered. Um, and that's really been sort of the biggest thing that's happened in the last five or six years is, is these great breweries have opened and, um, you know, each doing their own thing. Um, Goza was really just sort of a footnote um, back then, you know, sort of an obscure German style. And now it seems like every brewery out there does something, um, at least in name, that's a Goza. Um, pretty rarely do they have anything to do with with German beer and Leipzig and, and those sorts of things. So, so often now they are, you know, quicker sours with um, heavy fruit additions, things like that. Um, you know, those, those sort of um, curé beers, uh, beers that are uh, nearly solid. I don't know if, uh, how, how those are doing on the West Coast. I know uh, Marin Times does a couple of those. I know the brewery does some. Um, out here we've got places like The Vale that just do these beers that are 10% alcohol and um, you know, almost thick enough that you cut them with a knife uh, with the amount of fruit that's in them. And it's again, really just sort of pushing what uh, sour beer can be. And, and I don't always love them, but I'm always intrigued by um, breweries that really uh, go out of their way to do something unique. Um, there's so much more information out there than there was before too. Um, obviously Milk the Funk, I'm sure many of you are aware of between their uh, wiki and their podcast and the Facebook group and all that. And then uh, the Sour Hour uh, podcast, not to mention um, all sorts of other websites and blogs and, and things like that. So there's a lot more accessibility of information out there. Um, but uh, so often now, you know, I think we've reached that point where there can be just sort of a, an overwhelming amount of information that there isn't one or two souring methods to choose from. There are um, dozens or hundreds that you can find online. So um, I'm going to talk about sort of, you know, later, like the actual new information, but I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that I got wrong. And hopefully, uh, if any of you uh, got any of these uh, pieces of information from the book, I can, I can correct those misinformations now. Um, other than some sort of typos and stuff, there's a list of errata that I, that I maintain. Um, I think most of that has now been fixed in uh, subsequent versions of the book. If, if you have bought the book in the last few years, they're probably fixed already. Um, but sort of the two big mistakes I made uh, were saying that, uh, for example, if you want to attempt a beer with just lactobacillus, choose a highly attenuative heterofermentative strain such as White Labs WLP 677. Um, there is no highly attenuative uh, lacto, and I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, I also discussed how uh, White Labs uh, WLP644, Britannomyces bruxellensis 2 was a good uh, sub for the BSI uh, Brett Dre strain. And uh, information on that has come out that I got that wrong. Um, so lactobacillus for primary fermentation. Um, this is something I'd actually tried myself. I had bought a, a vial from White Labs, grown it up. Uh, my, my background is as, a, as an economist, and so I certainly won't blame White Labs for it. Um, it more likely was my uh, poor uh, lab hygiene in growing it up and particularly using, you know, plastic you know, gear that had been used for a dozen sour beers before it. 
Um, but I got a, a seemed like a good fermentation, a sort of a very uh, fine, uh, wispy, almost soapy head uh, during the primary fermentation, and and you know, 75 or 80 percent attenuation. Um, and it turns out that really lactobacillus, even those hetero fermentative strains, cannot do um, full alcoholic fermentation. So uh, Lance Shanner from Omega Labs. Um, he added an antifungal to, to make sure that there was no yeast that was present that would be able to uh, participate in the fermentation. And he found, as you can see there, the specific gravity went down from 1037 and at the lowest it got down to just under 1033. Um, so the real takeaway there is if you're doing a kettle sour or if you're uh, pre-souring with um, lactobacillus and what you think is a pure strain of lactobacillus, and you really start seeing that gravity drop. You start seeing, um, you know, rapid fermentation, rapid airlock activity, um, CO2 bubbles coursing through the the, the beer. Um, almost certainly, you have something other than lactobacillus at work. Uh, when lactobacillus, even heterofermentative strains, so heterofermentative means that they make a variety of products. Uh, homofermentative means that they make essentially just lactic acid. Uh, heterofermentative make lactic acid along with uh, ethanol, alcohol, and carbon dioxide. Um, but even then, it's really sort of a one-to-one -one kind of ratio. Um, and if you're making, you know, uh, a couple of, uh, you know, points of uh, lactic acid, you're only making a couple of points of alcohol as well. So, um, you know, just something to be aware of. Um, if, if you start seeing rapid fermentation, um, it might be time to stop the kettle sour before the, uh, the wild yeast really take over. Uh, my friend Matt Humbard, who's working on opening a brewery of his own, and I wrote a Brew Your Own magazine piece about five years ago where we tested uh, the terminal pH of five strains of lactobacillus, just trying to evaluate what might be the best or good um, lactic acid producers in terms of you know, how quickly they get there um, and that kind of thing. Um, so the uh, lactobacillus bucneri there on the left is just the Y yeast uh, 5335. They just call it lactobacillus. Um, lactobacillus brevis and plantarum in two and three are just the isolates from the omega uh, lacto blend. And that lactobacillus dobrookii is the white labs one. Um, so sort of typical uh, pH for a, a finished sour beer is probably in the mid threes. Um, real low threes, you're getting into that range of you know, aggressive acidity, particularly if you're not balancing it with some residual sweetness. Um, and at four and a half, where the lactobacillus dobrucki I finished, I mean, that's, you know, like our IPAs finish at 4.4 something usually at sapwood. So I would say that's not sour at all. Um, personally, we, I, I don't use the lacto uh, 677 from White Labs. I've just, I've never had great luck with it. Um, even in these sort of tightly controlled cases where there was no yeast, no hops, sort of nothing else that could, could cause issues. Um, it just really didn't produce much acidity. Um, I've heard from a, a handful of home brewers over the years who have gotten good sour beers with it, um, but uh, I get a lot more emails from people who say, hey, I pitched this lacto and it's been a few days. Um, it doesn't seem to be souring, what's the problem? Um, the lactobacillus bucneri from, from Y yeast over there on the left uh, was the most temperature sensitive. So I sadly, I think the, uh, over on the left there, the key is sort of being blocked probably if everyone has the same setup I do, did, but um, I believe the blue one, I don't know if me moving this does, does no, anything for anyone else. Every, or I can see everything. Oh, yeah, excellent. I can see it just fine. Yeah. Good, I, I, I have a little bar with people on, on it, but you can see the temperatures. Um, and so essentially for a good strain like a Brevis or a Plantarum, I mean, sort of wherever you want to sour it, it works out the same. Um, the next slide, uh, pictures. So, so Mike, just a yeah. question on that, just a question on that, because you're talking about 100% fermentation with, with uh, uh, lacto yeah. cultures, and you know, typically a lot of times what we're doing with, uh, you know, brewing lambics is we're trying to, we're trying to, uh, you know, use hops to try to uh, temper the, uh, the lacto because we're going to get, you know, overly sour beer, and that's one of the biggest problems that we that we that we see other brewers do when they're making lambics is they're too sour, and so you know, but you're 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 talking about some of these are not, some of these strains are not getting sour enough. Is that 
um, what, what am I missing here? Is it? Uh, yeah, so this, this would be in a case where you were looking to say do a kettle sour or something quick where you weren't relying on pediococcus or something else or a real long-term acidification. So really the goal here would be quick acidity for, I, I, I won't say I love kettle sours. I think kettle sours uh, fill a, a niche where you are adding assertive additional flavors. Um, I love barrel aged sours. I love long-term mixed fermentations. But if I was looking to say add three pounds per gallon of apricots and then dry hop it with uh, Citroen Galaxy, um, you are just going to completely lose all that nuance, all those delicate flavors that you built up during that time in the barrel. I'd rather just take, if, if that's the flavor I was looking for, I'd rather take a clean, neutral beer that I soured with lactobacillus, stopped at the, the pH I was looking for, and then fermented with, a, say, a clean ale yeast or 100% pretanomyces or a Saison strain, um, and then hit that with those intense flavors. Um, definitely, if you're doing a, a long-term mixed fermentation, um, a decent hopping rate can certainly uh, make for a much better beer. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, the way hops interact with lactobacillus is that as the pH goes lower, the, the amount of hops becomes more lethal. So um, a very small amount of hops may not stop lacto initially, um, you know, say five IBUs, lacto may initially be okay, but as it lowers the pH down into the threes, those alpha acids and those other hop compounds become more uh, toxic to lactobacillus. And so um, in some ways, the right hopping rate can work as a, uh, a way to sort of lock in the acidity that you're looking for. Um, again, that won't help if you've got pediococcus and the pediococcus can keep going and doesn't, doesn't mind the um, hop compounds. Um, what we do sometimes is we'll uh, pitch lactobacillus into the fermenter, um, either give it a little bit of a head start or co-pitch it with a brewer's yeast. And then when it reaches the pH we want, rather than having to worry about kettle souring and pasteurizing it to kill the lacto, we'll just throw in a small uh, dry hop charge or we'll add um, hop extract or something like that. And that's enough to um, halt the lactobacillus um, in, its, in its place for um, that level of acidity. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because in the sort of in the uh, traditional lambic, they, they they will use very large amounts of of, of hops to inhibit the uh, the, the lactobacillus uh, fermentation and the sourness of the beer, and then other breweries, you know, as as um, you know, presented in your book, are doing things where they'll do a, a fermentation, clean fermentation first, and then add the culture. So there's really not that much to 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 work off of so that they don't overdo the sourness of them. Yeah, no, it's and, it's uh, it's very tricky. I mean, really, uh, a lot of that with lambics is is do the cool ship. And for me, if you're not relying on wild microbes, the the sort of higher doses of um, of hops don't play nearly as essential a role. Um, when you're talking about cool ship brewing, you're you're having that word hanging out, you know, as it slowly cools down in in the you know, those, this prime range for the, the lactic acid bacteria, 120, 110, 100, where yeast may not be um, particularly adept, not to mention how quickly lactobacillus can grow. Um, and so, yeah, I and mean, that's, that's sort of the tricky thing with sour beers is it's very difficult to take um, one or two pieces of a particular souring process and method and apply those without sort of taking into account how it's going to affect the other parts of it. You know, just um, mashing hot may or may not be the right thing to do. For, for example, with our Saisons, we do a, we have a house mixed culture. We mash those in the 140s because what we're looking for is for that brewer's yeast to finish up quickly, get that beer as dry as it can, and then get it into kegs where the brett can then do its work over a few months compared to say something we're putting into a barrel where we want some of those more complex sugars for uh, pediococcus and, and um, sort of more aggressive brett fermentation. Yeah, that's interesting. What we do for the uh, for our uh, lambics is we try to create a very starchy solution that will be a little bit difficult to ferment. We're for, we're, so we're mashing at very high temperatures, we're sparging at high temperatures, we're, um, and then, uh, you know, we use uh, more hops than you would probably normally use, but not as much as a traditional lambic brewer. And then what we do is we is we uh, pitch all of the cultures all at once, and but we use we use some uh, we found that using uh, um, 
using uh, a good amount of uh, Saccharomyces so that it gets a head start over everything, everything else is that, you know, that combination helps us control the, uh, the sourness, the lactobacillus, because when we weren't doing that, we ended up with uh, beers that were, uh, you know, a little bit more on the, uh, the sour side, too, too, too much on the sour side for what we were looking for. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. And you really just have to learn your culture. There's no sort of, you know, um, universal right answer for most sour beer things. Um, for our uh, barrel program, we started out with um, a lot of bottle dregs, a lot of commercial cultures, and more and more we've now gone to, um, now that we have barrels that we really like, taking a couple of gallons from a favorite barrel and adding that to a, a fresh batch along with um, uh, Saccharomyces. Yeah, we do that too. We use a, we have a house culture going that we've been going for the last about five years. Yeah, and then it makes it easier to blend beers because then they've all got some of the same microbes in them. And yeah. Um, so the other sort of big uh, mistake I made again uh, back then, uh, everyone sort of talked about White Labs uh, 644 as if it was pretty much the same thing as uh, Brett Dre. Um, so just a little, a little uh, background, uh, Brett Dre was a strain isolated from Driefontainen, uh, Eau de Goose, particularly the J&J Blau, which was a, a special older uh, vintage blend of a Lindemans and I think a Girardin that uh, Armand did for a, a local uh, beer shop owner and the, the birth of his first child or their first child. Um, and uh, Adam Avery from Avery Brewing um, got a bottle of this when he was over in Belgium along with um, Allagash and uh, Lost Abbey and, and a bunch of other brewers and brought it back and said, hey, could you, you know, pull out this Brett strain that's so amazing and fruity and delicious? Um, and this is one of the first strains that really uh, gained some prominence um, six or seven years ago in doing 100% Brett beers. Um, Chad Jacobson from uh, now, now from um, uh, Crooked Stave uh, did his master's thesis on it. Um, and it was great when White Labs sort of had this strain released in 2014 and, and um, I'm sorry, they probably were like 2012. And they said, hey, you know, it's, you know, sort of this great primary Brett strain. I did some test batches for Modern Times with it. Um, I really had a, a you know, good experience with it. Um, and then uh, genetic sequencing was done with it and it turned out it was a wild Saccharomyces strain, not a Brettanomyces strain. Um, and in the end, White Labs just kept selling it. They released a new strain that they called uh, 648 Brett Brux Var Trois Varai, which is the true, the true Trois. Um, but they kept selling the old one just as Sac Saccharomyces Bruxellensis Trois. Um, and I really appreciate that because just because it wasn't Brettanomyces doesn't change the flavors it produced. Um, it doesn't change that it was relatively dangerous to mix with clean beers just because it was a pellicle performing uh, uh, dextrin fermenting strain. Um, and so um, it's very different than uh, you know four or five years before that, why yeast got rid of their uh, Brettanomyces anomalous strain because it turned out it was a Brettanomyces bruxellensis and they kind of went, well, we've already got a Brett Brux. Um, even though they're anomalous, I really liked, I used to use in the stout that I, I liked and um, has since gone out of production and, and why yeast doesn't even bank it anymore. Um, yeah, you know, and so that's sort of one thing nice, to think of. I had a nice uh, um, saison that I made with this yeast and and that this was before that that we that we knew that it was uh, uh, not a Brett, a real Brett yeast. Uh, but um, now we call it the uh, yeast formerly known as Brett Trois. <laughs> It's, and that's the, the tough thing with, with science. And the, there's some of the, the other Brett strains I talked about in the book, some of the other species that are, they're kind of in flux um, on what, you know, if they are really Brettanomyces or if there's something else. And in the end, for me, I mean, even as a small commercial brewer, I'm more interested in the flavor something produces than the uh, scientific nomenclature around what it's classified as. That's uh, one of the uh, paleo I did with, uh, with uh, Sactois. So sort of the things I got wrong, but now let's talk about um, really the things they've changed since then. So when and if they, they want me to do a second edition, uh, Brewer's publication usually looks for about 10 years between books on the same topic. It was about 10 years before American Sour Beers that like Wild Brews came out. What sorts of things would I be looking at? Um, lactic acid producing yeast is a big one. 
um, how to deal with acid shock and, and uh, bottle conditioning, these particularly highly acidic beers. Um, obviously talking about you know, the new breweries, my professional experiences, things like that. Um, and maybe expanding some information uh, available on um, things like THP, using herbs and spices in there, um, the huge range of microbes that are now available in Kulin Kavik. So lactic acid producing yeast strains. Um, this is a pretty new one in the last like two or three years um, that there are, you know, I, I was talking earlier about uh, lactobacillus really can't make acid and alcohol. Um, luckily for us, there are yeast strains that can make lactic acid and ethanol um, all in one shot. Um, there's some, some examples of the uh, genera up there. Um, the sort of easiest place to get it these days is from um, uh, Lalaman. So either the, the Philly sour strain or sour vicier um, are lactic acid producing yeast. Uh, Wild Pitch East Co. Uh, Matt Bachman uh, has a little yeast lab. He runs out of, uh, uh, I think he's in Indiana and uh, Maniacal up in uh, New England. Um, I'm sure there'll be more to follow. It's a little bit of a tricky area. There are a lot of um, university labs and companies that have been uh, looking to uh, get patents on the process of adding a lactic acid uh, yeast strain to a wort to make a sour beer. And so it's, it's a little bit of a weird area where there, there could be lawsuits or there could be um, things like that if you um, are doing it without being correctly licensed uh, by one of these. As a home brewer, I would imagine the, the risk is pretty low, but as a, a yeast lab or as a, a commercial brewery, there's the non-insignificant risk. Um, so some potential advantages. Um, they are pretty hop tolerant. If you want to do a, a hoppy sour beer, um, you know, obviously I would avoid um, heavy bitterness and sourness. Bitterness and, and acidity tend to have a, a pretty unpleasant flavor. Um, but if you're looking for, you know, say a dry hop sour or maybe a, a sour with some whirlpool hopping, um, lactobacillus is, is tricky. Either you have to sour first um, and then heat up to pasteurize and go that route or uh, do a long-term mixed fermentation barrel aged sour and then dry hop it after that's all done. Um, but for me, like the, so many of these wonderful new hop varieties have tropical, fruity, citrusy flavors that go pretty well with acidity. And so it's a, a pretty fun a potential uh, thing to try. Um, it's a single culture. So if you are uh, dealing with a mixed culture, often there's um, drift that happens over time, depending on the, the conditions, depending on how frequently you repitch, those sorts of things, the ratios of the different microbes will change. This is a single microbe, so just like any brewer's yeast, you can um, harvest it and repitch it. Um, there are reduced worries about cross-contamination. These uh, are very similar to other yeast. They, most of them are non-diastaticus. So you can use them in your clean fermentation tanks. You can put them in your clean kegs. You can bottle them with your clean bottling wand um, and not worry about it too much. Uh, they're pretty quick. You, know, you don't have to wait uh, six months or a year with these things, um, but they're not that fast. In my experience, it was about a month for uh, full primary fermentation. Some of them can make sort of interesting flavors. Um, they have uh, glycosidase activity. So uh, glycosides are some of these molecules that a uh, plant uh, binds a sugar molecule to a um, some sort of active, they call them a glycone sort of generically, but it could be an aroma molecule or sort of anything else. Um, and some of these uh, yeast strains can uh, break that bond, take the sugar off and release this um, hopefully potent uh, flavor compound. Um, again, in my experience, having tried a couple of them, uh, they tend to be a little bit cidery, um, not, not uh, offensively so if you had other flavors going on, but on their own, they weren't particularly um, exciting. Um, many of these have been identified in Lambix. If you, if you read uh, some of those studies on uh, Cantillon or, or Allagash, where they um, every week or every few weeks, they'll uh, test a spontaneous fermented wort and sort of uh, track which microbes uh, are in the highest concentrations. And, and things like uh, Hanziospora and Wicker hemomyces um, show up in some of those. So they uh, are um, you know, not, not inauthentic. And, and if you are doing the Lambic, maybe might be some things to add to a um, you know, mixed culture, things that are uh, long dead and no longer active if you're harvesting bottle dregs, but are there early on in a, 
a spontaneous ferment. A couple of samples that I got from Wild Pitch uh, right before I think I, I they were grown up uh, on uh, you know two or three days before I pitched them, so they were really fresh and great. Um, I just used a pretty generic base beer with some wheat and some two row and a little bit of golden naked oats. Um, I did a sort of split batch on each of them. Um, I did a control with just five IBUs at the start of the boil, and then one with a lower temperature, uh, large uh, American Whirlpool hop addition to um, you know, see how it would go with the hops. Um, and what I found was even though um, you know, it's, lactobacillus is really sensitive to hops, these strains both seem to be at least a little bit sensitive. Um, as you can see on, on day five, uh, it was still hanging around in the 1030s, um, but even sort of almost to 1040 for the hop year versions. Um, so I think I, this started about 1050, so it was only about 25% attenuation five days in, which um, is not really uh, awe-inspiring in terms of speed of fermentation. Um, you know, usually a, a healthy Saccharomyces ferment, you're just about wrapping up by then. Um, and in all the cases, they eventually got down to um, the base beer and the hoppy version, about the same final gravity. Um, but in the case of the, uh, the hoppy one, it took almost three weeks. Um, and so it, it, it got there eventually, but it was not, you know, um, fast. And as a commercial brewing set, setting, it wouldn't be um, exactly what we're looking for. Um, we've got some split batches going right now with uh, Philly Sour from Loma, and that seemed a lot more aggressive seemed a lot quicker. Um, and so I'm holding out hope that that might be a, a, a better option. Finish beers. Um, so one of the biggest issues you have with um, pre-acidifying the wort is um, you know, what that does to brewer's yeast. Brewer's yeast does not like super low pH. Um, and same thing when you go to bottle condition a finished sour beer, uh, whether it was barrel aged or, or however you made it, um, if the pH gets down to the low threes, if you're just pitching some cow ale or something like that, it may not have a great time. It really may not want to re-ferment. Um, and so uh, there are techniques you can use to sort of acclimate the yeast to that acid level. Um, and sort of the, the basic thing is to uh, expose that to a blend of your rehydrated yeast or your yeast culture and some of the sour beer that's going into. Um, and uh, I, I did some tests just to sort of take a look at how some different strains handled pH. Um, so this is California ale. So essentially I just made, it was like a brown ale kind of wort. Um, 5.1 was the sort of standard uh, initial pH without any adjustment. And I add lactic acid to get down to about 3.5, about three. Uh, if you can see there on day 11, the apparent attenuation for the uh, 3.0 uh, uh, pH really just never made it that far. It only got to 64% attenuation, um, about 5 or 6% less than sort of the standard pH. Um, and it just had these strong fusel alcohols, chemical flavors. Um, story was pretty similar for the dry English ale yeast, again, about 5% less attenuation. It just like it was, it tasted aged out, rubbery, and it had some diacetyl. Like, not only was the yeast not doing a great job fermenting, it was um, leaving a lot of off flavors behind. Um, and then even the same thing for the saison. The, the attenuation was um, similar to what the English ale and the Cal ale were um, in the the highly acidic work, but it was almost 10% less attenuation than um, the same strain and the same wort with less acid. So. Um, again, if, if you're into kettle sours, if you're looking at that, um, you're going to start running into trouble once you get down close to a, about a pH of 3. 3.5, all the strains seem to be pretty ha healthy and happy and not have too much trouble. Um, so one option is to um, acclimate yeast. Um, and so Matt Bachman wrote this paper a few years ago, Terminal Acid Shock Inhibits Sour Beer Bottle Conditioning by Sacramento Servicier. Um, so the, the backstory was that uh, Upland Brewing um, contacted him uh, since he was a microbiologist and new yeast and said, hey, we're having these sour beers that just stay flat. You know, we add priming sugar, we, we pitch uh, some of our um, house ale yeast and just sort of nothing happens. They just sort of sit there for uh, six months without any um, uh, carbonation. Um, and so he came up with a 
uh, essentially, a, a, you make a, a starter, you give it sort of um, sugar, you give it uh, yeast extract peptones, you give it a yeast nutrient, um, and then you mix it with the uh, beer that you want to carbonate about 24 hour, hours early. And what that does is dilute the acidity of the, um, that beer and it gives that yeast time to um, change the way their cell membranes are structured and sort of prepare themselves um, for that full um, environment. Um, I think of it a little bit like uh, tempering an egg. If you're cooking, you add a little bit of whatever the hot liquid is to the egg as you stir to kind of let that egg come up to temperature, get closer to the temperature of the, uh, the souffle or the, the mousse or whatever you're making, and then the whole thing can go in. Um, personally, we, we do sort of a very light version of this. Um, we use wine yeast for bottle conditioning and have had very little trouble with that. Um, we do use some of the startup nutrient. It's the same sort of thing as um, go firm. Um, so we'll rehydrate with that. And then over the course of about an hour, um, we'll have our culture in a keg and we'll slowly backfill the sour beer into it, just giving it time to adapt to the temperature change, the acid change, and then we uh, mix it mix it all in. Um, but uh, thankfully, uh, some folks on Milk the Funk have sort of developed um, sort of easy to follow uh, uh, acclimation techniques for home brewers or low tech versions. Um, so I'd suggest if you're interested in this, um, checking that out. Um, but again, if you're not having trouble with your, your beer's ball conditioning, I wouldn't worry about it. There are Scott and I hanging out uh, in front of our brewery, which since then now has a sign and some other stuff, but. So Mike, I got a question for you on that. Yeah. Because we've, I, I, I've not usually had trouble doing that, but. A, Many of the times, like if I'm doing a, a, a sour beer, so we have a lambic and then I'm fruiting the lambic and uh, the, the fruit will fer ferment. And it'll, if I let it go for, you know, maybe a, a couple months, you know, one or two months, then I can just, I can just bottle and there's enough yeast there already. But it, I feel like if it runs for longer, I've had a few problems with that and I've had to add some, some uh, bottling yeast, some yeast to bottle if it's been sitting for longer than that because well, probably it's just dropped out or something like that. Is there like a, you mentioned wine yeast, but is there like a, a, a preferred yeast for, you know, for bottling with sour beers? Sure, I mean, it's, everyone has a different strain. We use Premier Cuvée. Uh, it's a champagne yeast. It is so inexpensive. It's like, I think it's like $19 for a 500 gram brick of it. Um, I think it's good to 18% alcohol. It can do, I think the temperature range is 50 to 90. Um, we've never had a problem with it. Um, and we always add it. Um, I like the idea of when the beer goes into a bottle and you're introducing some oxygen, no matter how careful you are, that you have something that is just going to go right away, scavenge that oxygen, carbonate that beer and Put your mind uh, at ease. Uh, and for me, where you know, if we're bottling, generally between 800 and 1,200 bottles, as sort of a standard run for us. We we had one batch that uh, I think we we miscalculated how much carbonation was in the beer prior to uh, bottling, and it just never really carbonated. And we had to open 1,200 bottles, dose each one with uh, sugar tabs, dose each one with brewer with with a fresh culture of yeast. I carbonated right up after that, but that's two days of uh, unpleasantness uh, uh, that I'd like I've to avoid. <laughs> I've done it's, that as well. So yeah, that's happened. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, we've been open for a couple of years. We actually just signed a lease uh, a couple of weeks ago on a new uh, dedicated barrel space. that will be in the same um, complex. We're sort of between DC and Baltimore, um, just sort of in a generic office park. It, Looks very similar if you've been to all the, the office parks around um, San Diego and, and LA that have you know four breweries in them. Uh, luckily, being in Maryland, I, we, there's like 80 breweries in the whole state. I think there's you know some blocks that have that many uh, breweries in San Diego. Uh, we have uh, I must I'm clearly I, I uh, set up this uh, these slides for a group I was talking to in Spain I think because all all my numbers are in uh, square meters and hectoliters. It's, uh, it's a 10 barrel system. It's about uh, 7,000 square feet. Um, and we're, we've got that barrel cellar coming as soon as we can get uh, some HVAC put in. Uh, my partner is Scott Janish who wrote uh, the book, uh, The New IPA. He also writes uh, blog, scottjanish.com that he 
has continued to write two more than I've continued to write the Mad Fermentationist. I've been a, a little a little slow on that. Um, there, there we are. Uh, that's our, our brew house. There's a whole nother pad and uh, we just got three new 20 barrel tanks for our IPAs and we're doing a lot more canning and things like that. Um, so when I start out my program, it's, it's why I did at home. I, um, I intentionally try to increase variation, you know, using different grain bills, different microbes. Um, even if we were adding, say, um, white yeast lambic blend or yeast bay melange or east coast yeast uh, Flanders to uh, a full 10 barrel batch and then filling um, five barrels, five oak barrels from there. Each of those barrels would get um, particularly good bottle dregs if we open something interesting or um, we'd you know, maybe rinse some of the barrels and not rinse other ones or throw one bourbon barrel into a batch with, with red wine barrels. Um, you're really just trying to pull those strings so that when it comes time to blend, you have variety. Um, it's, it's not very... The way I generally put it is like colors. If it doesn't matter how many barrels you have that are that are yellow and red, if your end goal you want to be purple, um, and so the goal is for us was to have as many you know some barrels that hopefully were too sour and some that were not, not sour enough, some that were you know really funky and some that were pretty neutral. Um, and that way we can choose. Hey, this would be great on cherries. This would be great blended. This would be great. Let's hold on to that for another six months and see what happens. Um, our base beers are sort of all over the place. Um, our equipment is really basic, but we, we attempt to do everything we can to limit oxygen exposure. So everything's transferred with um, sort of a bulldog style, or it's, it's actually the more beer uh, barrel transfer tool because it was only 200 bucks. Um, so we do a lot of CO2 pressure to move things. Um, we use, I forget what I have pictures of in here, you know, uh, cultures. Um, we've got some flex tanks, which are just sort of big plastic um, tanks that you see a lot of meteries and some wineries. Um, for bottling, we have a little counter pressure filler. So we'll um, add a little bit of carbonation to the beer and then, um, you know, get them up to like one and a half volumes of CO2 and then add priming sugar and yeast to get the rest of the way. Um, just give us a real known starting point. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just like doing the same things I did at home, just at a much, much bigger uh, scale. Um, so, Mike, we, so, Mike, uh, how many barrels or how many containers do you have of different beer at that at, at uh, Sapwood that are aging? So it's it's like seventy barrels at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a big spreadsheet with like, you know, when the most recent top up was and what the most recent gravity ring was and what you know what we did for each of them. Um, and then yeah, it's it's um, it's worked out pretty well so far. We we have a couple of barrels that are probably going to be dumped, but for the most part, we really haven't had any um, duds. Um, ev everything's gone pretty well. Um, it's beer is getting better as we're sort of dialing in the microbes for our setup, and and you know we uh, we keep a lot of beer on hand for top up. So uh, about once every six months, I go in there with a. Blickman beer gun and I, uh, I fill up uh, the barrels to the brim just to avoid any headspace and any um, excessive you, oxygen contact as that wood the top dries. Yeah, what do you top them off with then? So we, we just save some of the, the base beer in kegs and generally in corny kegs so we can vent them down. Yeah. Um, and so it's nice just being able to top up with exactly the same beer that went in there. Nice. Um, and, yeah. and usually I'll try to avoid topping up within four or five months of uh, uh, packaging just to make sure that they're there. I'm not introducing any excess sugars or anything like that. Uh, I used to work at uh, Modern Times and they were nice enough to invite us out for, uh, for a blending session right before we opened. Uh, since some of the microbes out there were the ones I grew when uh, right before they opened. Uh, and they're uh, obviously, I'm sure you guys are well aware of them. They've got loads of barrels and they've got those big clay M4 over on the side and um, you know, it's, it's uh, going there is, uh, you know, hopefully looking, you know, 20 years in the future for us. I have no intention of getting anywhere near that big, but um, the, the way they run things is um, really top notch. Uh, what do people want now? Uh, a lot of fruit. Um, I, Jester King's doing like nine pounds of raspberries per gallon in some of their beers and Side Project is doing eight pounds of blackberries in some of their beers. Um, it really seems like the average beer consumer is looking for um, sour beer that really explodes with flavor. Um, I, I've always preferred beers without fruit, but I also recognize uh, 
that fruit is appealing and it's a fun, easy flavor. And it's a way to get people into sour beer. But I think these beers that have so much fruit miss out on what beer is best at. Um, what we generally use fruit for is the barrels we find less exciting. Um, I would always rather take the very best barrels and serve them as is, as a single barrel, as a blend with one or two other barrels. Um, but when we have a barrel that's, you know, the pH is three, five or three, six, it's not that sour. And it, the wood character is not particularly unique and the Brett character is not very exciting. Um, those are great candidates for fruit. Um, and I think that's kind of where you have to look at the whole blending program as a single um, unit. Um, and what makes sense for one beer may not make sense for the whole program. Um, and uh, that's, I think, you know, where, where things get um, unique and interesting for sour beer is how do you choose to blend things? What flavors do you prefer? Um, do you like a little bit of fruit in something? Do you like a lot of fruit? You know, which kind of base beer goes well with what kind of fruit? Um, I think hoppy sours are still kind of, you know, they'll never be the next IPA. I don't think anything will be the next IPA other than you know, Texas style IPA or whatever somebody will invent in a couple of years. Um, but I, I really do think with the excitement people see for hoppy beers that um, doing sour and hop together can be a great bridge, a gateway to someone who is an IPA drinker or vice versa for someone who's a sour drinker, you know, turning them on to IPAs, um, acid and hops together. Um, everybody likes sweetness. Um, and, and particularly, you know, people who are, um, you know, looking for something that's more dessert-like. Um, pastry sours have become a pretty big thing with, um, you know, often uh, vanilla, sometimes lactose, you know, fruit flavors mixed together. Um, you know, that's certainly, you know, making a, a stable packaged product is trickier with those. Um, I know a lot of uh, commercial breweries that do these things, sterile filter the beer before it goes on to the fruit. Um, and that's something that is, you know, outside the, the general range for a home brewer and, and honestly even for a, a brewery like us. But um, as a home brewer, you know, having really great fruit juice available to blend into a glass of sour beer is pretty much the best version of what that thing can be. And it's um, something you can do to taste, uh, whether you're, you know, juicing your own fruit or just getting a really good uh, uh, juice. It's a fun way to, you know, again, sort of explore those flavors, see what kind of combinations work well for you, um, you know, and just figuring out, you know, what, what makes sense. Um, if you put into, you know, if you get the beer pretty clear, you know, maybe you, you find it with gelatin or biofine clear and you keep it cold, you might be able to get away with that, you know, particularly again, when and if we're allowed to have parties again, um, you know, that might make sort of sense if you're making a, almost like a cask, um, but um, in terms of like a bottled product, um, you really then have to start thinking about lactose or um, you might have to look at, if, if you don't mind the flavor of a stevia or um, you know, a, an artificial or a, a natural uh, sweetener or something like that. Um, I know you, you look at the, the sort of the top sour beers, you, you more and more see uh, uh, beers with Jolly Ranchers and beers with, we, we uh, for Halloween last year, we had some fun and did a beer with Skittles, but you know, I, I, I can't talk down to anybody. But why am I excited to brew? Um, I've got a project going right now where we took uh, six kegs of a Belgian, um, like a 5%, you know, Trappist single sort of inspired beer and um, added a different culture to each one. I really love those beers when they are right between being um, a clean beer and a full on wild Brett beer. Um, and that can take a month, two months, three months, um, but where you still taste the, the, the clove or the pepper of the base beer, uh, there's still a little bit of that made banana or bubble gum, but some of that has begun to be um, uh, adjusted and, and transferred by the Brett. Uh, but before it becomes just a, a full on, you know, funk, funk assault. Um, and those are the kinds of fun beers that at home, it's, I don't know if I want to, you know, advise anyone to do this. It, it's certainly not the safest maneuver, but if you're bottling a batch of a clean Belgian beer or honestly anything you want to, to experiment with, um, you know, before you cap the last few bottles, just, you know, take a little pipette, drop in your favorite sour culture. Um, I mean, even, you know, it doesn't just have to be a single strain of Brett, um, a couple of drops from a Lambic or something can be great. 
Uh, we have a, a beer in bottles right now that is, um, we're calling it stallion cover. Uh, it's the classy version of horse blanket. There was a, a knockoff version of my book that Amazon was, was selling that somebody must have just run the text of a couple of my BYO articles through like a, like a word replacement algorithm. And so it, it replaced uh, sour beer with things like acrid lager and horse blanket with stallion cover. Um, but what we did was to take uh, about 50% of a stainless steel uh, rye saison, mixed ferment, but you know, pretty young. Uh, and then we had some older barrels of lambicky inspired beer that we um, blended it in, into it. They'd gotten a little too oaky. They weren't quite sour enough um, to really sort of stand on their own. Their pHs were sort of in the, the mid to high threes. Um, and really like as the micros from those barrels have gone to work on the saison, it's really become um, variable, but in a good way. You know, sometimes I open a barrel, a bottle and it is lemony and zesty and bright. And sometimes I open one and it's really funky and earthy. Um, and those to me, like that's like the, what the magic of sour beer can be. Um, it was inspired by uh, 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 Italian beer called Duchesic, uh, where they, uh, they, I think they just buy some, some Belgian Lambic and they blend it in. Um, I'm into weird forage beers. Uh, the, the folks at Scratch Brewing in Ava, Illinois uh, wrote uh, Homebrewers Almanac, which is fantastic. Um, we've done beer with uh, forage sumac, uh, fermented acorns, which are, are wild and interesting. You just uh, take uh, uh, acorns, you make sure they don't have weevils in them. Um, and you stick them in some mason jars for like six months or a year, and they just smell like like bourbon covered chocolate. Um, it's, it's just it's amazing. Um, and so we did like a dark a dark sour with them. Um, fresh juniper, sort of in that Scandinavian tradition. I've used ground ivy. I've used spice bush. Um, you can use barks. Um, you know, just there are so many beers being made commercially that all kind of use the same 200 ingredients, you know, the same yeast from the same labs, the same hops from the same, the same fields, the same malts, the same uh, fruit products that are, uh, even if they're real, they're, you know, the same Oregon fruit purees that, you know, everybody's using. Um, I think one of the great things about being a homebrewer has always been that you can do these things that are smaller and weirder and impractical for a big brewery to do. Um, you go to your local farmer's market to get grapefruit rather than um, turning to a, uh, a packaged, homogenized, or standardized product. Those are my acorns. I think that's it. I think I've, I've actually done a, a decent job. There's 10-ish minutes left for questions or comments, but if you don't want to ask a question and you just want to shoot me an email, I am not always as quick at answering as I maybe once was when I was sitting at a, a cubicle uh, eight hours a day, Monday to Friday, but I do usually always get to the questions eventually. Great, uh, thank you for that, uh, for the presentation, Mike. And yeah, let's open this up for questions and see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, so early in the presentation, Michael, you uh, mentioned or you had a chart about uh, pH and, and ABV. At a very quick glance, it looked like lower pH gave you or led to a, le a lower um, ABV. Is there any research further into that? I don't think so. I, I, my understanding is it, it was very, they're all very low. I mean, I think I can, let's see if I can pull, we'll pull that back up again. Let's see. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it was just, um, they're all, essentially the answer is none of them had more than 0.3% alcohol. Um, so my assumption was, let's see if you're, if your car correlation is right. It's very small percentages at, at that point. So. Yeah. So um, I, I would imagine that those would be strains that were more effective at converting sugar to lactic acid rather than converting sugar to ethanol and CO2. Um, that those um, reactions aren't necessarily one-to-one. -one. It can depend on the conditions and things like that. Okay. Other questions, yeah? Can I ask about the, uh, the, the acorns there? <laughs> You're sure. a, a, a shot of the acorns in mason jars. Is, I mean, what did you add to them to get them to 
ferment? Water or wort or nothing? Ab absolutely nothing. So the, the general process is that you, um, you harvest them and obviously like the, the quicker you pick them, the better. Um, I was out there on sort of a windy day, just grabbing them as they dropped. Um, I don't know how acorns are about you guys. I was not as careful as I probably should have been. And essentially anything that's damaged or that you see the slightest little hole in, that's a weevil that laid some eggs in there. Um, and so I gave them a quick rinse off and I left them just sort of in my basement in a, in a cool dry spot for about a week, just to sort of for that initial moisture to evaporate. Um, if you put them in the jar too quickly, you'll start to get mold, which you don't want. Um, but then otherwise, yeah, you just put them in the jars, um, you know, take a look at them every couple of weeks. Uh, mine, uh, you put the, put the lid on loosely because they'll start producing um, CO2. And it's just a, a spontaneous um, natural fermentation, just like if you were making sauerkraut or something else, just the microbes that are well suited to that environment do their thing. Um, the inside of the acorn goes from being that very sort of light, uh, whitish, you know, off-white kind of color to sort of a deep um, chocolatey brown. Um, and uh, I took about two of those jars for five gallons was about right. Um, I, I whirred them up in a, um, in a food processor just to get good surface area. Um, initially, I just tried hitting them with a hammer. Um, that wasn't quite enough. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, obviously, if the, the, the more delicate the beer, the more you'll taste them. Um, but that's one of the things I really appreciate about what Scratch Brewing does is it's not just um, take random ingredient, put random ingredient into the mash. Um, they really uh, go out of their way to choose interesting varieties or process them in unique ways or, um, and their, their book is fantastic because it'll say, hey, you know, you can pick it at this time of year and you'll get this flavor, or that time of year and you'll get that flavor. And we tried using the leaves in the, the mash and this happened and we tried using the flowers in the boil and this happened. And, um, you know, they, they are very much committed to local agriculture in a way that, that I, I have We've chosen not to be. They they use you know all hops from within 200 miles, all grain from within the state, um, and so their beers tend to be the grain and the hops tend to be very simple because they you know they they're not getting Wireman Carafa and they're not getting Citra. They're getting you know Michigan Cascade and they're getting the local you know Maltster does a Pills and a Pale and a Munich and a Crystal or something like that. Um, but it really gives them this showcase for um, the, the, the unique local ingredients. Um, and for me, that's sort of what I took away from that is I'd rather use, um, the Mid-Atlantic does not grow great hops, sadly. Um, the hops I've used from Maryland have not wowed me. Um, and we will we, we, we'll use some in sour beers and things like that, more to say that we did. Um, but we have great peaches, we have great nectarines, we have great cherries, we have um, you know, interesting, my, my wife has an herb garden out front and we've done a couple of beers with lemon verbana, with um, uh, rosemary, with, um, what else do we use from out there? Fig tree's not big enough. I guess the NBA corns, a, a couple other things like that that have just been able to glean off the land um, that are real unique, special products in a way that a local pale malt isn't, um, unless you're in, really interested in supporting uh, local agriculture and building that, that uh, capacity. Very cool. We have uh, probably time for another couple of questions if anybody else has other questions. I have a quick question to go along with that. Uh, what type of oak tree are you getting acorns from? Sadly, the, the oak tree I got them from was, uh, it was a white oak that was in my front yard and it was, must have been 150 years old and it died uh, promptly the, uh, the year after I harvested them. and. Uh, the city uh, put one up. But my understanding is any kind of uh, acorn should work. I mean, obviously, like anything, your your um, particular flavors may vary slightly, but I think so much of it is the fermentation that's giving you the flavor and not the um, and not the, the specifics of that um, uh, acorn. The process, as, as I understand it, gets rid of a lot of the uh, tannins and so that doesn't make an astringent beer or anything like that. I, I know white and red can have some uh, some tannin differences. So you don't have to leach the acorns like you do if you just use them fresh? No, yeah, you, it just really, it's a one-stop shop. It does the whole thing. You don't 
really soak them in water or anything like that and you just leave them whole until you're ready to, to add them. That's really cool. Yeah, I think, I can't remember what, if they have, they just sort of add to like, like a brown ale or something like that, which would probably be a better showcase for them. But um, we did a, a single keg. I had a lot of, I, I have a lot of fights with the, uh, the TTB. They, um, the federal government wants to say what you can or can't put in beer. And, and there are a lot of things that you can add that are uh, weird extractives that as long as some company is paid to study it, you know, that's safe in, in alcohol production, it's okay. But of course, no one's paid to have, you know, acorns in beer or sumac. Uh, and so uh, the trick with the TTB, if anyone out there is professional brewers, just to call it flour. So I add acorn flour to the beer. And they said, I didn't even need to ask for permission for flour because it was ground up somehow that makes it safe. And whole acorns, of course, would be uh, inadmissible. Um, but I, I uh, it's, it's always, th those are the things you have to worry about as a professional brewer that it's nice being a home brewer and just being able to brew exactly what you want and not have to worry about um, you know, go government regulations. Um, and so for us, I finally got through and we did like a little five gallon or a little 15 gallon batch for our, uh, our club holiday party last year. And it was surprisingly the beer that sort of made the, the most excitement, the biggest wave um, over and over and above, you know, some of the ones you'd expect, you know, the, the coconut, pineapple, sour, you know, pina colada and a couple of those that just uh, people thought were good, but, you know, not um, interesting or remarkable. Um, I think so many people have had so many beers now that unless something not only is interesting, but really good, they're just not going to be excited. Other questions? One last question. What about, you mentioned um, adding dregs from some of your favorite um, beers to barrels. Are you growing that up or are you just putting that small amount of, really, wow. It's, it's remarkable. Um, we had a barrel, I, 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 I try to avoid, you know, name, name dropping. We added dregs, it was one ball worth of dregs to 60 gallons of beer and three or four months later, it was already shockingly sour and assertive those those microbes if you get them in the right situation um you know I mean, we we talk about you know a primary fermentation for brewer's yeast being a couple of days you know you you double one to two to four to eight in a few hours um you know all of a sudden you're at you know 300 trillion or whatever it is in a, a couple of days so as long as the the conditions are right and those microbes are healthy um you could certainly make starters i certainly have made starters in the past um, but yeah, no, it's surprising. Just, just, um, the same sorts of barrels with the same worth that had the same mixed culture and primary, and then dregs really can, can nudge them off in a, a unique direction. I'm, I'm not much for microbiology. I, I don't do a lot of like isolation or things like that. I'm a big believer in, um, just, you know, tossing stuff in and letting the microbes fight it out. And then, you know, sort of doing more of a seed saving kind of thing where you're, by sensory picking out what barrels you like best, not because of the right mix of microbes or what it looks like under a microscope or the right uh, pH or titrable acidity reading or whatever, just the, does it, do I like how it tastes? Do I want more of it? Well, I think, I, I think that's 10 or seven for you guys, but thanks, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Mike, um, thank you so much for coming out here. A, a big round of applause for you. Uh, uh, um, this has been a really nice uh, uh, presentation. It's been really great of you to be able to jump on here um, and coming from the East Coast, uh, you know, someplace that we don't normally attract uh, guest speakers from to be able to hear from you. And hopefully when things clear up, some of us will be able to get out to your, to your place out at Southwood Cellars and be able to enjoy some of the beers that you're creating out there. Sure. If, if you do, uh, you know, please ask if, uh, if I'm around and I'm, I'm happy to pop out and, and give a tour if, I, uh, if I'm available, although uh, we'll, we'll see when and if that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Well, yeah, Mike, you're welcome to stick around as long as you want. I know it's kind of late out there. So, uh, you know. Oh, I'm, I'm done. I've got to talk to the, the fine folks of uh, the Lincoln Loggers uh, tomorrow night around this time. Oh, okay. great. All right. Well, thank you so much for jumping on with us. Cheers. Thanks. Thank Enjoy you. The rest of your meeting. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Excellent. So, <laughs> outstanding. Uh, so, I'm going to ask you guys if um, let's 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 
push this out, right? Oops, I can't do that yet. Let's share the screen first. All right. You guys got to tell me what you see. Do you see? Uh, um, do you see the presenter view, or do you see just only December twenty twenty? No, we see the whole presenter presenter view. Presenter view. Okay. How about now? That's better. There you go. Never know which screen is hooked up to what. So, uh, ex excellent. Anyways. Uh, everything's running on on course right here. Uh, that was a great presentation. I'm glad you guys got to participate in it. And uh, this is our December 2020 meeting. Obviously, we we're doing everything backwards, not because we're in a pandemic, but because we're attracting we coast agenda. Uh, um, and uh, in or and it's actually 9 p.m. out there. So uh, actually, if I mean 10 p.m. out there. So it's actually great that. Uh, um, Michael was able to uh, jump yeah. on with us today and we were able to work it out that way. So anyways, what we have planned out for today, uh, for the today's meeting is, uh, of course, we want to talk about the upcoming meeting plan. We uh -huh. did the uh, um, changes and developments in sour beer with Michael Tonsmere. We're going to have the uh, drawing uh, with the American Sours beer, Beers book that uh, Michael Tonsmere uh, um, authored. Is that the one with or without the mistakes? <laughs> wow. With the mistakes in them. You know, to be fair, some of those mistakes were the same, weren't his mistakes, you know? Oh, no, absolutely. We all, we all thought that was a, uh, a Brett yeast until, you know, a few, until we did some research, some research was done. And I, I actually used it in a beer before I knew it wasn't Brett, Brett yeast. And so, Anyways, um, really false advertising. I mean, yeah, yeah, false advertising. Well, I think his point was that if it makes great beer, or you like the beer on it, you know, who cares what they call it, right? Um, we're gonna have a holiday cheer with one of the with the, with the holiday beer. So save at least one of your holiday beers for that, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the homebrew exchange, some upcoming meeting plans, uh, an in intro to the 2021 officers, and then at the end of the the night, we'll jump into social time. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Here's your here's your warning that we are video recording the uh, presentation. Um, we already did that, so um, that's done. Um, and uh, now we'll go into the drawing for American sour beers. And I think uh, I'm going to turn it over to I'm going to turn it over to our uh, swag officer, to Todd, to uh, basically run the drawing for this. Uh, so Todd, you want to do that? You can jump jump in here. He might be in the restroom. <laughs> He's left the building. I'm actually going to jump should, out of this for a second. Should we take a bio break before we move on? <laughs> yeah, let's, do, let's take a bio break. Let's give you guys five minutes for a bio break. And, and refill your beers, whatever you got to do. We'll come back and then we'll continue here. Let's do that. Is that a recycle and refill? <laughs> yes. <laughs> 